So you've probably heard me talk about how great the Go programming language is, but this time, let's hear it from one of its creators. So today, I thought it'd be interesting to watch this video titled Why Golang is Successful by Creator of Golang by Rob Pike, try saying that three times, which was posted about five years ago, and I think the talk may have been done a little before then. Hey, Future Milky here. So that talk by Rob Pike was actually done in 2015 at Go.Dot, not 2019. That was just the date that video was uploaded. Sorry, got to correct it. Back to the video. But it's going to go over how Rob Pike, one of the original creators, talks about the things that they did to make Golink successful then and see if it still holds true today, five years later. Now, if you don't know who Rob Pike is, Robert Pike is a Canadian programmer and author. He is best known for his work on the Go programming language while working at Google, which is already impressive. But... Another interesting tidbit is Pike wrote the first Windows system for Unix in 1981. He is the sole inventor named in the US patent for overlapping windows on a computer display, which is absolutely insane. So I'm going to go ahead and watch a few parts of this talk and give you my thoughts on some of the things he says. But if you want to watch the entire thing, link will be in the description down below. Um, obviously, Go is successful. I mean, look at this room, look at what's going on here. Um, and a lot of people have asked why Go is successful, or have asked me why Go is successful. And a lot of people have answers that involve tooling or the language or things about it. But I think those are all sort of superficial reasons. I think the real reason is simplicity. Um, Go is simple, at least compared to a lot of other. I love how he starts talking about successful things and simplicity is the first thing he brings up because that is so true. Every time I've talked about Go to other people, they've always said Go is simple. It's simple to use, it's simple to read, and it's simple to get started. As well as just having the ability to do so many different things very easily or in a simple way. So like for example, I have this very simple script that just runs an HTTP server using nothing but the standard library that Go offers. Uh, here's another script that I kind of came up with, which just reads the contents of a file. Again, using nothing but the standard library that Go offers. And both of them are like 10 lines of code collected. Maybe this one's 15. But it's just so easy to get started doing so many different things using the Go programming language. Other languages that are running around at the moment. And so, but simplicity is actually a complicated subject. And there are many ways to think about it. Um, last year, about May, I think, I went to a conference hosted by Microsoft called Lang.next. And I saw a number of actually quite interesting talks, many of which were the leaders of a particular language talking about a new version that was coming out, like JavaScript, uh, PHP, C Sharp, and so on. And I really was struck by one thing about these talks and these languages, which is most of the talks consisted of features being added by taking something from another language and adding it to this one. So, you know, JavaScript's getting classes and that kind of thing. JavaScript classes still strike me as something so interesting because I personally have never used a JavaScript class. If you have, let me know in the comment section down below. But I love this point how all these languages back then and even now just take features from one another. If one language does something really well, another language like, oh, we need to then adopt this. And basically, languages evolve by just adding features from other languages to each other. And I realized that what's happening is all of these languages are turning into the same language. If you're in a logic programming language, you write a very different kind of program, you think a different way than if you're using an object-oriented programming language or a concurrent one. It's very much like disciplines in mathematics. You don't solve calculus using linear algebra, even though they have some structural sort of comparison. Um, and so I'm worried about this trend in the languages because if they all converge to the same language, we're all gonna be thinking the same way, and that would make life very, very uninteresting. You want to have different languages for different problems. You want to have different domains be solved by different ways of thinking and different notations. I think this point that Rob Pike is making is actually really good to stop in here and talk about TypeScript because I know a lot of TypeScript developers really enjoy the language because you can write your front end code, your back end code, and connect to DBs and basically write everything using just TypeScript. I don't think that's innately bad, but what I do agree with is we want optimal tools to solve specific problems where right now it feels TypeScript is almost like this Swiss army knife. It can do everything okay, but it's not the best tool for the job. It has its limits. And because TypeScript does everything sort of well, it doesn't do one thing particularly excellent. Whereas other languages that are designed and created to solve one specific issue, like backend programming language solving backend problems, you have more tools that are better suited for the problem. In other words, you kind of want a tool that's optimized for each particular way you're working. Now, these talks at Lang.next were about things like Java 8, ECMAScript 6, uh, which has been a long time coming, C Sharp, C++14, and there are a few others that didn't quite fit this mold, but, but let's just talk about the ones that do. Um, as I said, these languages are evolving by adding features. That means they're becoming more complicated. 
Their complexity is growing while they are simultaneously becoming more similar to one another. And that's a very strange situation for a field to right. be in. Um, I would summarize that as bloat without distinction. Um, Go, however, as I hope you appreciate, isn't like that. Go is a different language in this respect. Um, it doesn't try to be like these other languages because it's not. So I think this is where some of the differences from then and now are highlighted because since this talk and what Rob Pike is doing, Go has actually added two major features into the programming language, which were taken from other languages. The two I'm talking about are generics and iterators most recently. Um, it doesn't try to be like these other languages because it's not taking features. It doesn't try to compete by saying, oh, if they have that feature, we better have it, or people will be uh, unwilling to use our language. In fact, as of Go 1, which is, what, three years old now, the language is fixed. You, know, you may have noticed that the features that have gone in since then are absolutely tiny. There's really been no significant change to the language since, since Go 1, and that was the point of Go 1. Again, I, uh, generics and iterators would contradict this point. Uh, obviously, Rob Pike isn't involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the Go program language. I actually don't know how involved he is with the language, but generics, iterators have been added, and it really makes you scratch your head. How come enums have yet to be properly introduced into the language if we got generics, which I think wasn't that good of a feature, and iterators, which again, I also don't think are great features that we should have looked at and included into the Go programming language. However, many newcomers to Go start by asking, can we add this feature to the language? Can we make error handling different? Can we change the way arrays work? Can we make error handling different? This is a classic one. Everybody hates if error does not equal to nil or handling errors as values. And I get it. I get both sides personally. And obviously, I love the fact that errors are values and that it's up to the engineer, the author, the programmer to handle them specifically. You have in your ability to fully ignore error. You can just ignore it. Absolutely. Or you can choose to just print it and not panic or whatever. But I do think that granular control into errors gives you more flexibility into how you write your code, your program, which is one of the things I really love about Go. Or something like that. Um, but the language is fixed. Those things don't get to go in. But it's not just that the language is fixed. It's because adding features will not really make Go better. Adding features does not make the language better. And I fully agree with this. Like I just previously said, I think the major additions to Go have actually not made it better. But I do still believe in my heart that adding enums would make the language way more accessible and way better to use for so many different people and so many different engineers and their use cases. Why is that true? It would just make it bigger, but it would make it less different. And both of those are worse, in my opinion. Um, but obviously, you need features. You can't have a programming language without some features in it. But which ones? Well, obviously, the right ones. And so we picked the right ones. How did we pick the right ones? Well, one way is that the original language was designed by Ken Thompson, Robert Griesemer, and myself. And we all have very different backgrounds. Ken and I had worked together at Bell Labs quite a bit, but we also had done very different things. And you know, Ken is a god. Um, so when we came Ken to Thompson talk about what was god. going into the language, we insisted that all three of us not only agreed with the feature going in, but agreed that it was the right feature to go in. And with our different backgrounds and our different perspectives, that dramatically narrowed the number of things that went in to go. Um, but you still have to pick what to put in. And our overriding thing for doing this was readability. Uh, and here's how we think about this. If a language has too many features, or even more than you, know, you might need, um, you spend time programming thinking about which features to use. If there's really a lot of features, you may look at a line of code, write it one way, ooh, I could do something different, I could use this feature, I use that feature. You might even spend you know, half an hour playing with a few lines of code to, to find all the right ways you could use different features to make the code work a certain way. And it's kind of a waste of time to do that. I love that point. I know a lot of different languages, Python comes to mind, that you have so many different ways to like iterate through a for loop or map over things in a very Pythonic way. But someone who isn't a true Python developer may look at this code, like if they're a Java developer or a PHP developer, can look at this code and be like, what does this do? Only a person with deep Python knowledge would have that context to read the code effectively. Whereas with Go, I truly believe the readability is another point that makes a language so good. You can read Go code from any language, JavaScript, Python, PHP, C, whatever it is, and understand what's happening. But worse, when you come back to the program later, you have to recreate that thought process. You not only have to understand this complicated program, programming language doing whatever it's doing, you have to understand why the programmer, who might be you, decided that this was the way to approach the problem from the feature set available. Um, and that is just, I think, bad engineering. The summary, summarization of this is the code is harder to understand simply because it is using a more complex language. Mm, you want to have point. just one way or at least fewer simpler, easier to understand ways. So in other words, features add complexity. We want simplicity. Features hurt readability. We really want readability. And read 
Readability is paramount. Readability is, by my opinion, the most important feature of a programming language. Because readable means reliable. If you can read the code and know what it means, then you can, it's easier to understand, it's easier to... Readable means reliable. I would, again, agree with Rob Pike, but since then, I think one thing that comes to mind are iterators. I think the involvement of iterators really go against the readable perspective because here, here's a snippet of code from the actual Go uh, official Go website on the range funk experiment or using iterators. And if you were to read this function, even me, who's, I would say, familiar with the Go program language, I have a tough time understanding what's happening here. The syntax is kind of boggy. I mean, look how many times we're using the funk keyword. One, two, three, four, uh, five. And it's just like, what am I supposed to understand here? It's this, this block of code, the introduction of iterators, I think contradicts the perspective of readability when it comes to the original founders and how they created an intended Go to be used. To work on, it's easier to extend, it's easier to fix when it breaks, it's easier to understand why it's broken. These are all good things. And that is why readability is so important. If the language is complicated, on the other hand, you have to understand more to understand even where to start working on the program. And you have to understand a more complicated model in which the program is being written. These cost time and are, make the language harder to use. But there's a trade-off. Obviously, making more features in a language gives you more fun things to play with. Mm. And so there's a fundamental trade-off in Go that was made in a different direction from most other languages. And the trade-off is, what do you want? A language that's more fun to write in or easier to work on and maintain? I think a great, another way to say this is Go is boring. And that's intended. I think a lot of languages like JavaScript, TypeScript are more fun to work in because of how many things you can do with it. Going back to the Swiss Army example, yes, you can do so many different things, but it's not the best at all the things it attempts to do. Whereas Go, it's boring. It doesn't change. You know what you're going to get out of it. You know the standard library is probably going to cover 95% of the use cases for most engineers. And it's easy to maintain. It's easy to read. Whereas with TypeScript or even the Node NPM ecosystem, breaking changes are introduced all the time. I know people watching could be on their application. There's a new update to a dependency. They pull it in and bang, everything's broken. If that's happened to you, let me know in the comment section below. And for the most part, the decisions in Go about what went in were about long-term maintenance, and in particular in the context of large-scale programming, although that's a little off the topic today. So you have to keep all of this in mind when you're designing a language, and also think about what the goal is. What are you actually trying to achieve? What is the problem domain that this language is being done for? Well, in Go's case, we were trying to write code for Google, because that's what we do. Uh, in Go's software, at least the parts that we work on, are mostly infrastructure, server infrastructure, what we now call cloud software, but used to just be called servers. So this is actually a very interesting point about how Go was intended to be used at Google. Because if you think of projects built with Go, two that come to mind are Docker and Kubernetes. Kubernetes is built 97.1% with Go. So it's built with Go, you can safely say that. And majority of the time when people ask me, what can I use Go for? The first answer I say is, well, everything. But secondly, cloud infrastructure, integrating with AWS, building tools around the cloud. And it's really cool to see the reason why. It was originally created to solve these infrastructure problems, which makes Go so nice to use for this particular domain. And in fact, simplicity can be expressive. This is a very simple drawing. Rene drew this uh, a while back, and he, he's expressive, right? He's not really a gopher, and I'm not talking about the Magritte version of Sassine Bazin Gopher. I mean, he's just the representation of a gopher, very much like, like Shreve's talk earlier with the horse, right? And so this for me is what is, is part of like the ethos of Go. Here's this really simple drawing that represents what Go is like. We could put more features on it. We could make it more like a gopher. We could give them lots more detail. And we get something like this, right? <laughs> but mostly what we've- And another way to interact with elements seamlessly is subscribing to my YouTube channel because most of you are being complicated and not doing that. So go ahead, be simple, feel simple, and click that subscribe button. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you watch the entire talk. The link will be in the description down below. But it was very interesting to see how Rob Pike talked about the success of Go back in, what, 2019, five years ago, maybe even more, to how the language looks today. And I'm curious to see how the Go programming language evolves moving forward beyond versions 123. But let me know in the comment section down below, what do you think the changes of Go? Do you think it made it better, made it worse? Do you still like Go? And did this video make you interested in trying out Go? Hopefully you guys like it, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.